All right, welcome to today's webinar. And if you are interested in Taco's Spectral Flow service, you can check it out at taco.bio slash spectral dash flow dash cytometry. My name is Ramji Srinivasan. I'm co-founder and CEO of Taco. And we're gonna to talk to you today about our spectral versus conventional flow essentials or basic series. And specifically, we're going to talk to you a little bit about how Spectral allows for higher parameter analysis. So this is a gentle introduction to Spectral Flow. You may have heard of it, and you may be interested for your drug development program. And we're going to go through some of the basics today. So one of the major problems with conventional flow cytometry is that it records just a snippet of a waveform. So over here, you have, say, a light source that hits different cells. As a light source hits a particular cell, it goes through a series of prisms and gators, uh, gates and then gets reflected through di what's called dichroic mirrors, di meaning two, two croic meaning color. And as it gets reflect, reflected into these colors, you're only going to get a snippet of the waveform. And we'll talk a little bit about why that might be a problem. Compare this to spectral flow. And similarly, you've got a laser that hits a cell and goes into a series of prisms and gates. And then instead goes to what's called a collimating lens, which keeps all of the light bars in parallel and then grading, and then will be recorded into a detector array, which allows you to record the entire emission spectrum. So we're going to see why this might be interesting. Here's an example of a waveform recorded with conventional flow. So the x-axis over here is a wavelength in nanometers, and the y-axis is going to be the relative units. And so here you have a conventional flow, which might be able to only detect a, a this is called a bandpass filter in this 670 nanometer range. So plus or minus seven. This notation 670 slash 14 means that you can detect plus or minus seven. So 663 to 677. Now let's assume that you have a red laser at 640 nanometers and you excite to specific fluorophores. Let's take APC as a first fluorophore, and this emits a particular spectrum. So you can see over here, it goes from around 600 to 750. And then let's take the actual numbers that are recorded by the detector. So, you know, this is a kind of conceptual diagram. The detector might record, say, the number 55 here, which corresponds to this area over here. Next, use the same detector and on Alexa floor at 647 nanometers. And in this case, the detector might only record a 45 number because it's potentially lower peak. So, you know, visually you might be able to distinguish this, but the machine only sees this. It only sees these two numbers. So it's hard for the machine to distinguish what are called two overlapping signals. Now let's compare to spectral flow. So we simplified a spectral flow, but on the x-axis, you're gonna see a bunch of different detectors, everything from ultraviolet to violet, to blue, to yellow, green, to red. So 64 de detectors, sometimes other, other machines have plus or minus detectors, but that gives you a sense. There's a lot more detectors. The y-axis is gonna show you relative emission. Now let's run those same colors through again. So let's take you know, APC, and then here, there actually may be emission spectra detected all the way down here in ultraviolet, and then violet, and then blue, and then yellow, green, and red. Okay, this is interesting, because you remember last time it was just at red. Now let's do this similarly for Alexa Flora 647, and here nothing is picked up, similarly in violet, similarly in blue, similarly now in yellow green we're seeing something and now in red we're seeing something so this is really exciting because you can see visually these are distinct but then mathematically at the bottom these look enough there's enough distinction between these two that a computer can eventually separate them out and we're going to come to that in a little bit so what why would a drug developer care about any of this well the basic premise is that spectral flow can distinguish overlapping signals that would stump or confound conventional flow. So you remember this was conventional flow. You had these two overlapping signals. You can't distinguish these kind of 
parameters or fluorophores, whereas on spectral flow, these are readily distinguishable. And that means you can pack more parameters in a specific experiment or a specific uh, uh, analysis. So more to the point, this is a comparison between these two from a drug developer spent standpoint. Classical flow you can potentially look at six to eight markers. It means about 52 potential subset, subsets, depending on how you count out and how you build out your panel. You can recover a lot of cells, it's fast to run, and obviously it's, it's affordable. Spectral, you can run more markers and you can get a potentially six-fold increase in the number of subsets that you're able to analyze. A lot more cells recovered and a lot faster, and then obviously tighter variation because you're gonna be collecting a lot of events. So that means for a drug developer, more markers and finer resolution on what your therapy is doing to these different immune subsets. So let's see this in action. And this is a 40 marker panel that came from OMIT69. And the researchers mentioned gamma delta T cells, which are associated with major autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And we covered this in a previous spectral flow webinar. They basically take up a lot of channels to resolve. This was the 40 marker panel they used. And you can see our friend gamma delta over here. And if you go to the actual gating plot, which is quite complex, you need to get to many cells, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, eight, around there to get to gamma delta T cells. So it's quite complex to actually resolve this. And this is the emission spectrum for a 40 marker panel. Um, and you can see on the x-axis, again, remember those emission channels we had, we excerpted them before, but now you're seeing the full spectrum, everything from UV1 all the way to R8 and the percent of normalized emission. This is a, something that would be very challenging to resolve on conventional flow. You'd have to untangle all of these. In fact, if you use conventional flow, you might have a bandpass filter that looked over here, another one that looked over here, another one that looked over here, and then looked over here. And the issue with that is things in this range would be indistinguishable through a bandpass filter. So for example, PE, uh, C floor, YG584, et cetera, one wouldn't be able to distinguish these signals through a classic bandpass filter. So that gives you a, a sense of why spectral flow might be more useful than conventional flow. But we talked about unmixing, and we'll give you a quick preview of how unmixing works underneath the hood. This isn't going to be a full tutorial, but just a, a little bit of backgrounder. So you remember this curve that we showed from spectral flow. We showed APC and Alexaflora 647. So remember, this is ultraviolet, violet, blue, yellow, green, red. And this is APC and AF 647. We're going to take a more simplified example. And to do that, we're going to show you what the experiment design looks for looks like before acquisition. So before acquisition, you take a cell and we're going to label A, B, and C, and light is going to be emitted from each of these detectors that, excuse me, each of these uh, floor fours that's going to be picked up by the instrument. And then in parallel, we're going to have a set of single color controls, A, B, and C. So remember, we've got one cell labeled with all three, and one cell labeled with each of these. And so, you know, readers who might be guessing ahead can figure out that we're gonna use these controls to what's called unmix and separate out each one's contribution. So let's take the cell with all three fluorochromes on it, A, B, and C, and this is the observed spectra from that cell. So you can see that goes up to a big peak over here and then down. So the X axis is the detector and the Y is intensity. And now let's take the single color controls, and these are going to be needed to determine the intensity of each fluorochrome. So this blue line over here is A, this contribution, B, and then C. And so x-axis is the detectors, y is intensity. From these two charts, we can determine the attribution. So this is gonna be, we're gonna term this the attribution matrix, but basically we wanna figure out how much of each of these fluorochromes is present on the cell. So over here, you've got the individual spectra, A, B, and C, and the detectors one through 20. 
individual spectra, A, B, and C. And then on the right-hand side, you saw the observed. So this is the combination of all of them. And the question is, how much does each fluorophore contribute to the total? And the reason you care is this might be PDL1, this might be CD4, et cetera. This might be a marker that you care about. So you want to know the number of those particular molecules on the cell. And just from the individual spectra it observed, we can, we can calculate this. So how does that work underneath the hood? And you remember we have three matrices. One is the mixing matrix, the second is the attribution matrix, and the third is observed. The mixing matrix is 20 by 3, the attribution matrix is 3 by 1, and the observes is 20, 20 by 1. So just a quick, quick peek back at this previous slide. This is the mixing matrix, this is the attribution, and this is observed. So we're going to label the mixing matrix M, the attribution vector A, and the observed matrix O. And then we'll, our goal is to solve for A, lowercase a. So the equation is MA equals O, and then A equals O times M to the negative one or inverse. And without doing the matrix calculation here, this is the computation, which is that channel A, the attribution is 10, channel B, the attribution is six, and channel C, the attribution is four. Um, so as a result, now you get how much of each of these fluorochromes is present on uh, the individual cells. So you've got individual spectrum A, B, and C, and the individual attribution over here, A is 10, B is 6, C is 4. And you can just double check this because, for example, let's take one row over here, row 3, A multiplied by 10, 0 by 10 is 0, B, 0 0.1 times 6 is 0.6, C 0 times 4 is 0, so you get 0 0.6. We won't do all the math, but all the math checks out. For example, if you do row 7, 0.15 times 10 plus 0.3 times 6 plus 0.15 times 4, that gets you to this calculation over here. So in sum, spectral is an incredibly powerful technology that allows you to adapt your experiment and find more parameters, get finer grain resolution for your therapies. And if this sounds interesting to you uh, and you're interested in spectral flow for your next experiment, contact us at TACO and we'd be happy to, to talk with you and uh, potentially help you design. So thanks for coming by.